So I get asked the question quite often, and that is, heat pumps, how do they work? And I like the word heat pump, eh? Because it's sort of, I don't know, it implies something more than there is to my mind. And of course the government here in the UK is very keen for people to be no longer using gas boilers. And there's an awful lot of incentives to go into air sourced heat pumps to replace gas boilers. So heat pumps have become a thing of our century. The thing about heat pumps is you find them everywhere. Our uh, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, refrigerators and air conditioning are all the same thing and they rely on some basic behaviour of gases. So the first thing we need to do really is have a quick review of how gases behave. It was in 1662 when Boyle came out with the first one and it's the infamous one called Boyle's Law. Then quite simply, it's a relationship of a gas between pressure and volume. Basically, if you have a gas enclosed in a volume and you reduce that volume, the pressure goes up. Equally, if you increase the volume, the pressure goes down. There we go. That's Boyle's Law. And it's something that is kind of intuitively obvious and pretty easy to demonstrate, really. But equally, it was in 1662 when they came out with it. Now, it was, um, I think, about a hundred years later, 1787, when Jacques Charles came out with Charles's Law. Charles's Law, the relationship between volume and temperature. So basically, if you have a volume of gas and you decrease that volume under constant pressure, the temperature has to go down. Equally, if you increase the volume, then the temperature has to go up. Another very intuitive and somewhat obvious statement about what happens to temperature when you change the volume of a gas. And it took a hundred years between those two to do it. And it was Guy Lussac's law in 1808 that related pressure and temperature. I mean, you might think, hey, right? okay, Boyle talked about pressure and volume. Charles talked about volume and temperature. Hang on, isn't there a relationship between pressure and temperature? <laughs> yes, there is. And Lussac in 1808, who expressed that, and of course it's the same thing that we know. You want to increase the pressure in a fixed volume, you increase the temperature. So those three laws relate pressure and temperature and volume of a gas, and how, those gas, how that gas will react given a change in pressure, temperature or volume. Uh, it was Avogadro who came up with the final contribution, and that was the greater the number of molecules of gas, the larger the volume it will occupy. I mean, a statement of the obvious. The prize has to go to Avogadro, doesn't it? And that was in 1811. Now, those four laws are the basic gas laws for the behaviour of ideal gases. And of course you can combine them all because it's pretty obvious that they all actually relate to each other. And if you think about how an engine operates, then those laws are the laws that describe the operation of that engine. I mean, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, what is temperature? Well, temperature is actually a measure of movement. When something moves quickly, we measure it as a higher temperature because movement is the result of energy. A molecule will move relatively slowly if it doesn't have much energy. You put a lot of energy in there, it's going to zip around like a mad thing, and we measure that as an increase in temperature, but it's really an increase in movement, which is a measurement of the energy that you've put into the molecule to get that molecule to move. Now, when it's in the air, we don't really perceive that, but when you put it in a closed vessel, of course, you perceive that as pressure is the pressure is actually the force exerted by the molecule on the sides of the chamber that's containing it. So if it's moving quicker, it exerts a greater pressure, and that makes really common sense because it's just hitting the sides faster and harder, and of course that's what we get as pressure. Now, if we have it in a complete, completely closed cylinder, then it'll hit it hard enough to blow that cylinder to pieces. But if you think about what an engine cylinder is, an engine cylinder is enclosed on all sides except one. That one side is where the piston is. So of course if we increase the energy in the gas, it's going to act 
on all the walls, but the only one that can do anything is the piston, and so the piston will move. So of course that's exactly the kind of behaviour that we want because that mechanical arrangement of piston and cylinder is the method by which we can extract work from the gas as long as of course we put work in first and we can extract that work out of the gas by changing the pressure, volume or temperature. Uh, it works because it is constrained on all sides but one. It doesn't matter what that unconstrained side is made up of. Traditionally we think of a piston, but of course it could equally be a diaphragm, which is nothing more than a balloon stretched over one end. We'll see the balloon pop out. It can be a column of water. I was asked, could you make a compressor, a tyre compressor, into a motor? Well, yes you can, because a tyre compressor is exactly the same as a piston compressor, it's just that the tyre compressor is in fact just a diaphragm, the same as in your petrol pump. It's constrained on all sides but one, but instead of having a piston, it has a diaphragm. If you attach a linkage to that diaphragm, you'll have yourself a motor. Now the only thing about diaphragms, of course, is they are materially contained. So they may be made out of rubber, they may be out of steel, but the amount that they can flex is fairly limited compared to a piston which can move a long way. So they tend to operate at very high frequency to move the same volume because the degree of movement that they have is very small. The behaviour of the gas within the constrained cylinder will push against something that can be moved and it doesn't matter what that thing is, be it a diaphragm, be it a column of water, be it a piston, as long as we can arrange a linkage we can get the work out of it and that's obviously what we want when it comes to running an engine. Of course there are other laws like Graham's law and Dalton law but the four basic gas laws describe really well how gases behave and how they can be constrained within engine types to do work for us. Bearing those things in mind, the particular mechanical arrangement that we use actually doesn't affect the description of it one jot. What it affects is the method at which it will do it and the materials that you can use, but the actual function of it is identical. The thing about gases is they're about the only thing that you can compress, and that's because they're very far apart. In liquids and solids, they're very, very close together and they're relatively incompressible, but gases are just hugely spread out and so you can squeeze them together. I mean, in this room right now is about a kilo of oxygen, despite this enormous space that it's filling. So gases are unique in that they can be compressed and of course that's key to their behaviour. So what do you need to make a heat pump? Well, turns out actually not much at all. You need three things, small tin, a big tin and some gas or a liquid that will turn into a gas easily. All you do is connect the two tins and you cram your gas or your liquid into the small tin and turn a valve. Obviously the gas will then rush into the big tin and the volume has increased. And because the volume has increased, of course the pressure has dropped and the temperature has dropped. And you get a cold tin, a big cold tin. Now if you put that into a hot space, of course thermodynamics says the heat will go from the hot to the cold. And so the tin will warm up a little bit and the space will cool down and that's exactly how a refrigerator and an air conditioner works. Now the next bit is a bit pushing the stone up the hill because you've got to get that back gas back out of the big tin into the small tin and of course you've got to cram it in there because it's a small tin. You do that you need a compressor. The compressor will cram the gas back into the tin and of course because it's the same volume of gas and now it's now in a smaller tin pressure goes up and hey presto temperature goes up. You stick that in a cold space and of course that heat is going to then radiate out from there into the cold space and warm up the cold space. And that really is all there is to fridges, air conditioners, ground source heat pumps and air source heat pumps. That cold tin is stuck in the ground or stuck in the air and takes the heat from the ambient. It then gets put back into the house and gives the heat back out. So essentially you just get that hot tin and stick it where the sun doesn't shine and sure you're going to be warm and toasty. So any heat pump consists of five parts, a hot tin, a cold tin, some pipes to join the whole lot up, a compressor and your refrigeration liquid or gas. 
Once you put those things together, you have yourself a heat pump. Now, of course, in real-world applications, they tend not to bother with the hot and cold tin. Instead, they use a coil, which is part of the pipes joining it up. And you find that coil in a fridge, buried in the fridge. And, of course, the hot side is at the back of your fridge, which is why your fridge gets hot. In an air conditioner, that coil usually goes through some aluminium fins, which acts as a heat exchanger, and then you have a fan blowing the air over it. But the essential components of all of those devices are those five things. You can turn anything into anything else. So you can take an air conditioner and make it an air source heat pump if you want. You can take a fridge and do exactly the same thing. The only issue with fridges is that the compressor is made to run on and off. And so if you run it a long time, you'll wear your compressor out pretty quickly. So it's not a good idea to do it in the fridge because you burn out your compressor. But the theory is sound. You can certainly do it if you don't care about your compressor because all of these things work in exactly the same way based on that simple idea of gas. When you change the volume, the pressure, the temperature, they relate to each other. And that's all there is to it. Anyway. I thought I'd explain that because I've been asked several times. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope it helped you with um, heat pumps and how they actually work. Thank you very much for watching. And please do remember to like and subscribe and click the notifications bell.